My name is Michael Neblo, and I will be serving as your host today. I am a professor in the Department of Political Science here at OSU, where I direct the Institute. The agenda for today's webinar is as follows. Um, I will uh, introduce our two distinguished guests and uh, proceeding, proceeding that, uh, do a little bit of setup. Uh, then we'll move to some brief opening remarks from each of our distinguished panelists. Um, that'll be followed by a discussion among the panelists that I will moderate for about a half an hour. And then we're going to reserve a half an hour, the final half an hour, for questions and answers, uh, questions from the audience and an answers from our panelists. Um, on some technical matters, during the Q&A, audience members are encouraged to ask questions using the questions button in your control panel and typing them in. You must hit send in order to submit your question. Uh, you can't just hit return. If you don't see your control panel, it may be collapsed. So just look for a right facing arrow icon and click that and it should expand. We will be keeping audience members muted to keep things simple and uh, simple technically, so there will be no verbally announced questions. That is, the raise hand button will also not be necessary. If you have any questions about the webinar itself, you can ask the organizer, Amy Lee, in the chat function. So let me move on today to uh, introduce our two uh, main panelists. Uh, Amy Fairchild is Dean of and Professor in OSU School of Public Health. She is an historian who works at the intersection of history, public health ethics, and public health policy and politics. Her work helped establish public health ethics, which is con concerned with the well-being of populations as fundamentally distinct from either bioethics or human rights. Dean Fairchild has written two books, Science at the Borders, Immigrant Medical Inspection, and the Shaping of the Modern Industrial Labor Force and Searching Eyes, Privacy, the State, and Disease Surveillance in America. In addition, she's published in an array of leading journals, and the National Endowment for the Humanities is funding her current book project, A Social History of Fear and Panic, an unfortunately timely topic. Um, uh, Dean Fairchild is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, and she received her master's in public health and her PhD from Columbia University where she was on the faculty for 22 years in the Mailman School of Public Health. Our second panelist is Edward Ned Foley, who holds the Ebersold Chair in Constitutional Law at Ohio State, where he also directs its election law program. His new book, Presidential Elections and Majority Rule, which I can recommend to you warmly, I've read uh, myself, um, well, or the think piece for it, excavates the long forgotten philosophical premises of how the Electoral College is supposed to work as revised by the 12th Amendment to the US Constitution. His uh, book before that, Ballot Battles, The History of Disputed Elections in the United States, uh, is again, uh, unfortunately, potentially anyway, uh, a highly uh, uh, timely reprise. Um, Professor Foley clerked for Ch uh, Chief Judge Patricia M. Wald of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and Justice Harry Blackman of the United States Supreme Court. He has also served as the state solicitor in the office of Ohio's Attorney General. Professor Foley is a graduate of Columbia University School of Law and Yale College. Okay, um, I'm just going to make a few quick uh, remarks to frame our discussion uh, a little bit today. Um, but uh, I'm eager to get to our panelists who are uh, the main attraction, I'm sure, here. Um, part of the reason the, the Center for Ethics and Human Values and, and IDEA wanted to um, pull together an event uh, along these lines is because there's quite a bit of concern about how uh, the COVID-19 crisis is going to affect the 2020 elections in the United States. And those concerns emerge from the ideological left, right, and center as well as from different domains, public health and the legal political community most prominently. On the left, there are concerns that President Trump will use the powers of his office in the most extreme scenario to cancel or delay the election, failing that to influence the election in his favor. Um, there are also worries about allowing interference from foreign powers, and should he still lose to delegitimate the outcome in a bid to stay in power. On the right, there are corresponding concerns that the Democrats and elements of what critics call the deep state will steal the election through vote fraud and administrative corruption. And in the center, there are concerns that there might just be genuine sources of ambiguity 
and threats to the proper administration of the election of the elections. For example, via a hasty ramp up of mail-in balloting that overwhelms various local administrative capacities. And in addition to these substantive concerns, they worry about perceptions of illegitimacy, even if things go well enough as a matter of fact. In addition to these legal and political concerns, the public health community, of course, worries that without proper precautions and preparation, the election might serve as a catalyst for the resurgence of the virus's spread. So with that little bit of framing, let's get going with our panelists today. Dean Fairchild, would you like to go first with some opening remarks? I think I've managed to unmute myself. Yes, you have. You can, all right, excellent. So what I'll give you is a, a little bit of history, a little bit of ethics and a little bit of pandemic to get us, us started here. So uh, just a couple of things to know about history. Um, people have always risked their lives to exercise their, their rights. And historically, those have typically, typically fallen on the shoulders of those without power, uh, those who are subject to stigma or discrimination. So think about laborers uh, organizing for the right to organize. Think about uh, folks organizing for the right to free speech. Um, women. Uh, organizing for the right to vote and some of the some of the um, abuses they they endured like being jailed uh, in in asking for those rights and certainly we have to think about the whole history of African Americans African Americans and the campaign to to um, win the right to to vote particularly in this in the South but also you know the, the ways people put bodies on the line simply to exercise their everyday rights like being able to to um, sit where you want to in a in a cafe, to ride the bus and sit where you want to. Um, um, and if you think about moments of, of epidemics, um, isolation and quarantine and um, containment procedures have also often fallen on the shoulders of, of similar stigmatized or discriminated against groups. So African Americans and Mexicans and Filipinos have been targeted as one example uh, in efforts to contain tuberculosis. Chinese laborers, when it comes to smallpox or the plague, have often been contained in ways that were um, not only bad public health practice, but uh, bad social justice practice. Prostitutes have been the targets of um, campaigns to control sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, Haitians, gay men, um, people who inject drugs experienced the same thing in the early years, particularly of the HIV and AIDS epidemics. Um, and and it's important to, to raise AIDS here because that really began to change the discourse in, in public health. Uh, it wasn't really until the 1980s that uh, human rights and rights really became central to the way we talk about practice in, in public health. And, and, in, and in this context, stigma and infringements on rights in some ways began to, to be seen as a threat as profound as a disease itself. Um, and, and the consequence has been, um, has been that although there is this long history of upholding public health powers, um, since, the, since the 1980s in particular, a kind of due process has been into, in, built into the system in which we understand that, of course, you're going to give people the right to, um, uh, to, uh, to a court hearing if you're, if you're quarantined or, or isolated against your, against your will. Um, so against that really broad backdrop, you know, along comes COVID-19. And even as late as March, early March, uh, ethicists were talking about the idea of mass quarantine, sweeping social distancing as simply too blunt an instrument to be useful at all. Um, but then look what happened. We've had, you know, some 95 percent of the population under stay at home orders or, or some kind of, um, um, of, of lockdown. Um, there has been protest, of course, against these measures more recently, but the thing that's really remarkable is the, the continuing broad social acceptance of, of uh, social distancing measures and even concern about rolling things back too soon. Um, so, um, you know, the, the narrative that we 
are hearing now is that we're all in this together. We're all in this together. And there's a certain power to that narrative. Um, populations uh, that have not historically borne some of the burdens of disease containment, of demanding rights, are now experiencing these burdens. Nobody can go to the movies. Nobody can go to dinner. Nobody can get a tattoo. Uh, everyone has lousy hair and is running low on toilet paper. Um, and, and everyone risks uh, uh, must run a risk to, to vote or stands, uh, to, stands to lose that right to vote. Uh, and as I said, there's a, there's a potential and a power in that, but we, we shouldn't, uh, that in this moment in, we, in which we have, which we're confronted with this idea that we shouldn't have to choose to be at risk in order to exercise our rights. Uh, and from the public health ethics perspective, you know, this is where people would argue that this is really a kind of a false choice. Um, that, um, you know, that we're at risk for many things at the same time. Our, our right to travel is at risk, our right to vote is at risk, but our health is at risk uh, at this moment in, in time too. And, and we need to be very aware of, of the ways in which uh, broad public health powers are protecting us, but also prohibiting us at the same moment in time. And, and the and the, the kind of balancing we need to do as we think about that going forward. Um, but if, if there's a kind of power and potential in this moment, it also masks something important, this idea that we're all in this together. So let me take you back to the beginning, African-Americans, Latinos, urban communities, industrial communities, rural communities have all been at greater risk they, they are at risk of, have been at risk of a kind of triple whammy. Um, they have been the most likely to be laid off, the, the least likely to have health insurance or paid sick leave, and the most likely to be in jobs that place them at higher risk for COVID-19. And these are some of the groups that have been at most at risk of having, uh, having their vote being suppressed throughout this long history. So, so for some of us, we still have these tenacious roots in stigma and, and discrimination. So you know, I, I would wrap up what I have to say by way of introduction um, by, yes, this question, this idea that we're all in this together is really important. Uh, but what we have to ask is, what does it mean in this context? Yes, we all may uh, be, at, be risking our health if we vote. We all may be at, may be at risk of losing our right to, to vote. Um, but the, the real question is really, what is it truly going to take to make sure we're all in this together? And that, and can we use this as a moment to um, not only address those risks for all, but correct some of these um, historical inequities? Great. Thank you very much uh, for those opening comments. Ned? Yeah, well, and thank you, Michael, and to the sponsors and organizers of this important discussion. And I do want to come back to this theme of whether or not the burdens are equally shared across society or, or whether there's differential burden, because I think that's going to be an important uh, theme to think about as we evaluate our capacity to run the election this year. Um, but I'd also like to start with history. I think a historical perspective on this is valuable. Of course, the history I'm going to give you uh, the old period is January and February. The new period is March and April. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it, it's that different a world. And, and um, so to take you back to just January and February of this very year, this presidential election year, the election law community was worried that we were facing unusual stresses already to our democratic system, um, some of which was coming out of the impeachment uh, remember, impeachment is now old news. Again, it seems like ancient history, but that was just January and February. Um, but that America had never had a presidential election where a first term incumbent was running for re-election having been acquitted in an impeachment trial. And that was gonna hover over uh, the legitimacy of the election. Uh, this, the Democrats in the Senate were saying that that this incumbent shouldn't be allowed to run again. So, you know, that was the kind of climate where that the year began. Of. And I was in particular worried that our whole way of understanding uh, 
the validity of an election, whether we were running a valid election or not, or would have a valid outcome, had been affected with um, since 2016 with the Russia hacking and all of the disinformation. And therefore, we needed to go back to kind of first principles to think through, you know, what is a free and fair election in America? How do we know whether we've got a good, a valid result? Again, in January and February, those were very real questions, and that was all before the virus really took over and has added an extra layer of you know, monumental burden on our electoral system. Now, when the virus first hit, I was actually optimistic that that we could handle. I mean, here in Ohio, you know, the, the, the immediate lockdown period happened right around the date for our primary. And it caused a lot of confusion as the public health officials were deciding, can people go to the polls on March 17th or is that too dangerous? And ultimately, uh, Dr. Amy Atkin with the governor's uh, blessing said, no, that's too dangerous. We're supposed to be in quarantine. We need to flatten the curve. Um, and as chaotic as that was, it seemed to be the, the, the right outcome from the moment. And so my optimistic takeaway at the time was that if we could handle that acute crisis in, in the context of a primary where it's happening so fast, we're going to be okay for November because we've got eight months or so. And so we can do this. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yes, this is going to be a big challenge. It's not going to be easy, but we do have enough time to ramp up vote by mail and to make polling places safe so we can have a free and fair election, notwithstanding the pandemic, because it hit in March, it didn't hit in October. And even if there's a risk of a second wave, we're ready for that because we were hit with the first wave and we know what to do. I hate to say it that, you know, now we are sort of mid-May, um, my level of pessimism has increased considerably in that the, that the pandemic is going to cause problems because it's going to lay the foundation for other things going wrong. In essence, it, it's a combination of the pandemic and those antecedent factors. So if we have serious problems in November, I don't think it will be caused by the pandemic itself. I think it'll be partisanship that will cause us to, to have a dysfunctional election. I mean, I, I hate to say it, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that America is never at the risk of a failed election, a failed presidential election. We've never really had that in our past. With all the issues over Bush versus Gore and hanging chads, um, there was a kind of randomness quality to the hanging chads that didn't make it a kind of systemic failure. If we end up having disenfranchisement being outcome determinative, that, that I think will be a, a failure of a different character. And it will have been a failure that's now foreseeable because we know what a pandemic can do to our voting process, but we won't have adequately responded to the concern. So what do we need to do? Again, there's two dimensions to voting that need improvement to meet the threat of the pandemic. You know, one is vote by mail. There's been a lot of discussion of that over the last couple of months. I'm sure we're gonna to wanna to talk about that. Um, and that means that many states are gonna to have to just uh, prepare for significantly increased percentages of vote by mail than they're historically used to. That's a logistical challenge, but if there's the will to do it, it's feasible. Other states do it. Um, any of the battleground states could do it as long as they have the political capacity to prepare. Likewise, there's going to need to be in-person voting in November. We can't rely exclusively on vote by mail for a variety of reasons that we could discuss. Um, and it's going to be a challenge to make uh, polling places, you know, appropriately sanitary and hygienic so that voters are feel comfortable. But South Korea showed us that this is possible. Um, and again, with enough planning, with enough hiring of poll workers who are not elderly and at risk, that you know, we train the poll workers over the summer and the fall, we staff up well enough, this is doable. But it's only doable if we do it. And so failure is not guaranteed, but success is not guaranteed. And the most disturbing dynamic in Wisconsin's primary in April showed this, and again, we can go into the details if you want. Wisconsin showed us what happens when hyper-partisanship causes gridlock 
and causes the incapacity of the political system to solve problems for the benefit of the electorate. Wisconsin is a battleground state, so is Pennsylvania, so is Michigan. All of those states have the same dynamic where currently they have um, governors of one political party and the legislature of the other political party. And that, frankly, is my biggest fear, is that there's going to be this political gridlock that's going to prevent the capacity to build up to address the situation. Uh, so if we don't, you know, if we mess up, it'll be our fault collectively. It won't be the virus's fault. Um, but that, uh, you know, that'll be our collective failure to exercise self-government. Now, to back to the differential burden, you know, again, if this burden fell equally across society, then, you know, there, there might be the political will to solve it on behalf of everybody because every voter would be kind of equally affected. But the political parties, the incumbents, are making calculations about whether high turnout or, turn or low turnout is to their advantage. They're self-interested partisan advantage because they see differential burdens. You know, they see that there's the risk that um, urban uh, populations, big cities, are going to have greater logistical challenges in vote by mail and in-person voting. This is what happened again in Wisconsin. Milwaukee got hit a whole lot harder than the rest of the state. So we could see Philadelphia get hit very hard or Detroit get hit very hard and that that could really affect the race. So that's my biggest fear is that partisanship gets in the way of a successful election. Um, so that's my opening gambit. Great, well, thanks to, to both of you. Um, I'm going to get us rolling here. I, I hope that our conversation will be pretty free flowing. Feel free to address each other irrespective of me. Um, and uh, and uh, if you like, uh, as a political scientist, uh, I'm I'm going to be the moderator here, but I can also weigh in as a political scientist in various respects if people are interested in things along those lines. So I'm going to start us off, Amy. During your opening remarks, you referred to um, uh, you know protecting your voting rights, people protecting their voting rights and protecting their health as um, a false choice. Um, and I was, I wanted to invite you just to elaborate on that, um, in the sense that, um, it, is it not the case that, uh, certain, a certain status of the virus interacting with certain institutional limitations might not actually present people with, um, trade-offs? Well, let me let me go back, and I th I think what I was mostly trying to say was that we ha the debate up until this point has been framed, I think, in terms of false choices, that we either that we either protect our our we either protect the public health or we protect our social and political and economic systems, and in fact, those two things can't really be teased apart. There is evidence from um, McKinsey that that's uh, showing that you know we we stand as of a, a few weeks ago to have lose about five percent of the GDP as things stand. But if we don't contain the virus, that that figure could go up to something like thirteen percent because of the loss of of consumer confidence. I guess you know the thing I'm trying to say it is not as though um, it, you know I have both I have both of these interests at the same time. I have an interest in voting and I have an interest in 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 protecting my health, just like I have an interest in having my job and I have an interest in being able to travel freely um, that I hold all of these things at the same moment in time in one in one in one person. But I mean, but the point Ned was making is and I was making to some extent is that um, there have been particular segments of society who have been systematically excluded from a whole host of things that have produced disease disparities and that are going to shape the outcome i think of of the election and i'm really i'm very concerned about the things that ned has talked about that we have the technical capacity to prepare for the fall to make voting places safe to to prepare vote by mail but you know even looking at the the past two months one of the whole rationales behind social distancing was that it was buying us time. 
It wasn't saving us, it was buying us time. It was buying us time to make sure the clinical systems, hospital systems were prepared, to make sure that the public health system had the testing that it needed, the surveillance capacity that it needed. And uh, I think in some places, like Ohio, we've used that time well. We haven't used that time well across the, the, the nation. So it, you know, the if we can do it is a big if. Um, the if and the will we do it. And I, I'm, I'm skeptical about that too, and, it, and it's cause for concern for me. Great, thank you. Um, Ned, did you want to jump in on that or? Um... Well, I'm, no, I'm, in one sense, I'm pleased that there's sort of agreement on the, on the technical or technology point, the notion that from a public health perspective, as well as from an election perspective, we think that we could run an election that is safe for voters, whether they vote by mail or some in person. Uh, and, and again, I, and so I think we could, we could have success both from a public health side of the analysis and an election side of the analysis. So that's, but we can't be complacent because um, again, the, I hate to use the analogy, but the pathology, the worst pathology in this system is not the biological pathology, it's the sociological pathology that could prevent us from self-government or what, or meaningful self-government. I mean, I, you know, the, I think Americans don't like to declare failure, right? And we don't, we don't, we think of ourselves as a successful nation and we think of our political system as successful. So, you know, more likely what will happen uh, is there will be an outcome that, you know, will, We'll have a certified tally of votes that will label somebody as the winner, but will it be authentic? The authenticity of the result depends upon a fair opportunity to participate among all eligible voters. Um, but we won't have, have had that precondition if the, if the interactive effect of the virus and the lack of political will causes segments of the community to lack meaningful participation. And that's what we were seeing in Wisconsin. It had two dimensions to it. One dimension was the failure of the government in, of the state of Wisconsin to give voters the absentee ballots that they had requested. They had done, the voters did everything right. They were registered, they were eligible, and they had submitted timely applications. But because Wisconsin wasn't prepared for the flood of requests, it just overwhelmed the system, and so they just didn't give voters the ballots. And then they said, well, oh, don't worry, you can go to the polls instead. They said that in a week where the, you know, the White House itself was saying, don't even go to Walmart if you can avoid it that week because of the need to flatten the curve. So it was sort of a false choice in the moment. Um, but then, you know, and we have to applaud the civic courage of the voters who did go you know, these, these pictures of people standing in line for hours. But that was the point in Milwaukee, there were five polling places that were open when there were supposed to be 180. Hmm. That's not genuine democracy, that's kind of sham democracy. Um, and so, you know, my, again, we, we could learn the right lesson from that and say, never again. And we guarantee in November, we're gonna have fully staffed polling places that'll be, from a public health perspective, okay. And we're gonna make sure we give everybody a ballot. But we will have had to do that if instead we do a rerun of Wisconsin and then say, oh, we produced a winner, it could be a sham. Now, the reason why Wisconsin didn't turn into even more of a nightmare is it turned out it was a landslide. The, ma the major race on the ballot was a state Supreme Court election. It was expected to be very close, but it was incredibly lopsided. So it didn't go into a second phase of litigation, you know, thankfully. Um, and, if the, and if the election's all in the fall or landslides, then that's okay. Democracy will have worked despite the disenfranchisement. But, the, but my fear is the result will be close and that the disenfranchisement will have affected the result. And then are you willing to accept the, a, 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 a vote tally that is predicated on the kind of disenfranchisement that Amy was talking about. That, that doesn't seem like genuine democracy. Thank you, that's, uh, that's really helpful. I'm going to, I, I've been debating in my head as to whether to wade into uh, 
uh, this territory. It's going to be a little bit touchy, um, but I think that's where some of the interesting action is. Um, you referred to political gridlock um, uh, being the source of uh, your concerns. Um, and I take those to be not just personal concerns, but your concerns for the country and as a as a scholar of the law and a former officer of the law um, or, or advocate for the law. Um, uh, I want to make sure I ask this the right way, um, because I, I believe that both parties um, typically will act aggressively in their advantage. Um, but the advantage is organized uh, in a way, or at least the perceived advantage is organized in a way right now um, that uh, seems to be asymmetric with respect to the parties. So I, I guess the pointed way uh, of asking the question, and I apologize if this is putting you on the spot, is whether it's partisan gridlock per se or um, obstructive behavior, um, on the asymmetrically obstructive behavior. Yeah, well, I'm curious to what Amy thinks about this as well, but just to take a first crack at it, um, I think we have to be concerned about both. There's no doubt there is there is the asymmetrical bad behavior in our political system right now, and we should acknowledge that and worry about it um, and figure out how to deal with it. Because ultimately, um, as a political scientist, you know that, that, that the successful running of the system depends as much on acceptance of norms as, a, as the rule of law. And those norms have to include kind of fair play and the notion of we're all in this together, as Amy said, we have to have a sense that it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, we're all people, the virus attacks us all, and we run a country on behalf of us all. If there's not enough of that sense of in it togetherness, you know, our legal system can't, can't help us. Um, so, so that is undoubtedly true. On the other hand, I think to only talk about asymmetry at the moment um, would, would neglect the additional problem between now and November that gridlock in a divided government situation can cause. Because, you know, frankly, we've had some of that asymmetry here in Ohio with respect to gerrymandering. But you know, and, and in politics is complicated, but I'm less fearful of Ohio for November because we don't have the kind of gridlock situation that Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, and Michigan have. So I think we have to keep our eye on both your asymmetry point and a real separate gridlock point. And the two in combination are even a worse toxic brew for getting things, things done. Amy, do you want to jump in on this? Well, I'm, I'm trying, so Ned, I'm trying to kind of think of the public health analogy here. Uh, and and um, I don't know that there's been obstructive behavior, but certainly there's a divide in, th in, tr in thinking about how serious the virus is. That, you know, from this is, this is, you know, this is a cold, this is a flu, the, the cure is much, it's much worse than the, than the, the pandemic it, itself. Uh, versus the other side that it is serious and we the, the the consequences of letting the virus gain the upper hand are quite are quite serious knowing that it has its own it has its own rules um, that we have to that we have to follow but that you know but the, on the bright side that we can follow and again Ohio has been a really great example of how you strike that balance I think but I also worry about a kind of public health gridlock setting in in, in Ohio as, um, as I think the pressure to open up the state mounts, that's gonna have, um, and again, the, the, the impact of the, the cases and the deaths are going to fall most heavily in the most vulnerable populations. Um, they're gonna fall most heavily in those 65 and older, those with, with comorbid Condition, so it's going to it's going to increase a lot of a lot of uh, inequity, and you know you, you wouldn't I don't think that's as a result of gridlock or obstructive behavior. I think it's just a it's a result of a kind of um, uh, political polarization and very 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 different views about what science is, what it can tell us, and and I think one of the the really important things to underscore is that there's still so much we don't know about how this virus is going to behave. 
So, you know, Ned, when you, you know, you did your history and, and talked about January, February, and then March, April, I mean, that's, you know, that's really important. And November is going to be um, kind of at the height of cold and flu season. So we'll not only be thinking about COVID-19, we'll be thinking about influenza. And we don't know how these two things are going to interact and intersect and what it's going to mean for, you know, sort of what social distancing might look like in at least in particular parts of the country come that moment in time. And it really is going to go back to the, the question that Ned, Ned laid out. Are we going to use the time that we have wisely to make sure that we're prepared to A, stem any potential return to the kind of measures we've seen, but also make sure that the polling places are what they need to be uh, in order to keep people as safe as safe as possible, at least to keep the, the risk in a polling place no greater than the risk that we would have in our ordinary lives in in just in what's a we're in a different risk environment now than we were this time last year we're going to be in a different risk environment for another year 18 months two years it's going to it's going to be a while that we're going to be that we're going to be trying to always hit the right balance great thank you um so shifting a little bit um there's a there's a political scientist from the 1950s who um, uh, was very optimistic about how the social sciences broadly understood, including public health. Um, it, he included public health in in that uh, category of the social sciences, or as a borderline, um, you know, or hybrid uh, sort of uh, endeavor, um, and was very uh, optimistic about how advances in the social sciences and uh, technocracy can improve society. And in a really wonderful um, turn of phrase, he said that the, the science of public policy can give hands and feet to morality, um, which I, I think is true um, in a certain sense. It can give hands and feet to the morality in the sense of, um, uh, you know, being part of knowing how to implement uh, the, the ethical and moral principles that we um, want to see realized in the world. But as a political scientist, um, uh, I think he underestimated the sense in which politics feeds into public policy. <laughs> um, uh, and so, and thus the science of politics in one sense bears a similar uh, relationship um, in terms of enabling the ability of, uh, of the science of public policy to give hands and feet to morality. Okay, that was a long wind up um, for going back to Amy's uh, sort of um, interesting and uh, subtle distinctions in the we are all in this together, you know, noting that there's a certain power to um, the kind of solidarity that that evokes, but that it also can um, eclipse or, or otherwise obscure uh, ways in which we might not be equally in it together um, or, or ways in which um, there are systematic differences. And, and Ned expressed um, uh, concerns about this too. One of the most interesting to my mind and, and recurrent findings in political science though, is that if you, if you really take the we are all in this together frame, um, you get much more progress on uh, the the remedies for the things that were not in that were admittedly not in it together on, um, and that it ends up being progressive for the people uh, that um, were differentially impacted uh, as well. Um, and so, uh, even though I think as a matter of public health ethics. Um, uh, which you, you are not just eminent in, but a founder uh, of, uh, as I noted before, um, there might be an interesting disconnection between how uh, the, the strategies for getting from here to there um, than what they would seem to be from a, a pure analysis of the public health ethics. That was a bit of a, of a, a meandering, you know, large two-point question, but I guess um, it's to say, would you be open to a fairly full-throated notion of we are all in this together 
driving public policy um, if it meant that we get half a loaf of bread? Um, well, so that's a calculus we make in public health, uh, I think, all of the time. And, um, and let me just take a step back and think about, you know, your, the, your quote that you had from, you know, from the, from about public policy in the 1950s. So that, you know, there's this, there was this period in time in public health in the progressive era in which we thought science was going to solve everything. Uh, and there are, you know, often sort of discussions even in public health about evidence-based medicine, evidence-based policy that I, th I think can sometimes feel naive. Um, you can't, you know, public health, like all science, is social, it's political, it's values-based, and the challenge that we always have is to be very honest about the values we bring, because that shapes the way we interpret evidence. It shapes what we even think counts as evidence in, in the first place, and we can have more robust, more authentic conversations if we are, if we can recognize our own values and the ways it drives us and, and, and recognize them in others and have a, a conversation about values and evidence at the same moment in time. But, you know, but one of the, so that's this broad backdrop, but, you know, one of the, you know, sort of the premises in public health is, is I'm going to take the example of smoking. So um, the, and when we, we begin to pass sort of sweeping laws against smoking in public places in the 1970s, 1980s. Those had a dramatic impact on decreasing smoking in society as a whole, but they had a much larger impact on, uh, on, um, on upper class, middle class, well-educated uh, people uh, than it did on working class um, minority populations. And so what you begin to get, you begin to see a growing, I have to watch my hands here, you begin to see a growing disparity. So smoking rates for everybody went down, but they went down for, for, for upper class whites uh, much more than they did for working class populations, populations without the same education and, without the, and, and minority populations, but they still went down. And so the question is, if, if are measures that help everybody, but that maybe deepen divides acceptable. And that's where I think we have to apply a kind of utilitarian calculus. And, and I, so I think there's a, there's a, there is a, a potential in seizing on this idea that we're all in this together, but what we can't do is lose sight of the, the divides that still exist. We may be lifting everybody, but but not as much. And we have to continue to ask ourselves these questions: Is this acceptable? And 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 not just look at the whole, but be willing to parse it out into its different pieces and understand how these things that do make a problem much better can still benefit everybody, but also deepen some social uh, divides. That are that are really important. If if we take this idea that we're all in this, this together seriously. Thank you, Ned. Do you want to uh, say anything about that? Uh, sure. I think Michael, your question about the relationship of politics and social science is a really important one. And I think again, the different way that Ohio and Wisconsin kind of handled the pandemic in the midst of voting during the primary season shows that. There are different ways that those two things can interrelate with with consequences. Now, again, Wisconsin was a month later. In some ways, you'd think they'd have an easier time with it, and they had a worse problem. And that's because I think they had a different relationship between the public health component of analysis and the, the politics. What, what do I mean by that? In Ohio, um, again, it was a little bit chaotic, but but they the night before the primary, basically what happened was a two-part decision-making process of government, a kind of a separation of powers or a separation of functions. You had Dr. Amy Acton, a non-elected public health official, make a purely medical or public health judgment about what was safe or not safe with respect to people congregating in public at polling places. And as I understood her analysis, it was it wouldn't matter if it was bowling alleys or stadiums. There wasn't anything intrinsic about it being a polling place where you vote that was causing the public health risk. It was the public congregation of it. 
that was problematic and was unacceptable at that moment, given the need to flatten the curve. So she didn't make an election, election law judgment or an ele election administration judgment. She made a public health judgment within her area of expertise as a conscientious, nonpartisan public official. That, so that's a pure example of social science in the service of the public interest. It was left to the Secretary of State to pick up the electoral pieces, so to speak, of the consequence of that decision. Because there were election consequences, there had already been some absentee voting and some in-person early voting. So the election had already started. There just hadn't been election day polling place voting. And you couldn't run an election that was two thirds complete and, and say, we're done. So Secretary of State says, oh, well, I need to remediate the problem. And he proposed a remedial solution that from a, a, a voting perspective was pretty robust in terms of giving people opportunities. He said, we're gonna have another day of voting in June 2nd, I'm putting it far out because I hope by then we'll have figured out how to vote in person without public health consequences. I'm also gonna have some extra absentee voting because I know people are gonna be vulnerable. So from a full opportunity perspective, it was a very good solution. The legislature took it away from him the most political actor in our system in a way, the legislature cut back on the voting opportunities. Now maybe you could say it was justified because it was only a primary or not, but it was still a separation of the political judgment and the initial public health judgment. Contrast that with Wisconsin. The, go the governor dithered and dithered and dithered. And you know, again, you asked about gridlock and asymmetry. Wisconsin is an example where you know, there may have been more blame on one side of the political aisle, but there was plenty of blame on both sides in terms of the, the elected political officials. And the governor did not handle the situation very well. By, verse, by first, you know, delay, 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 and then at the last minute makes a decision. He doesn't let his health director, his equivalent of Amy Acton, make the decision. He makes the decision himself, and he purports to actually rewrite the election rules nothing that Amy Acton attempted to do. And so he, it, you could see how that looked like a, an aggrandizement of political power in the office of a governor, which could be a kind of a dangerous thing. That did not happen in Ohio. So how the politics and the public health interacts is, is really important. And the two states show that they can interact in very different ways. That's terrific, thank you. Um, so now we've already arrived uh, at the portion of uh, the event where we're going to pivot into questions uh, from the audience. Um, the first one is from Tim who asks, is there a concern of actually choosing our president without national uniform regulations? In effect, we have 50, 50 different elections and I, I could, uh, note, uh, as someone who's worked on a little bit of this, it can be way more than 50. Um, uh, there are thousands in California alone of jurisdictions with different requirements, um, uh, opportunities for in-person voting, absentee voting, vote by mail, the need for voter IDs, et cetera. Um, how do, has the coronavirus uh, era expanded these differences from state to state? And to bring um, Amy in a little bit, um, I'll also just note that um, the, the sort of um, public health geography of states um, and even within states varies in a way systematically by party um, in that more rural states and rural parts of states tend to be more Republican. They have lower density, uh, uh, population density, and thus have different dynamics with respect to um, uh, the spread of the disease in public health. So, Ned, why don't you lead us off? Because the question was primarily directed at, uh, toward you, I think. But um, with that uh, sort of emendation, I'm going to uh, also turn it over to Amy afterwards. Sure. Um, well, it's a great question, Tim. And, um, you know, it reminds me of the fact that the Supreme Court this morning was dealing with oral argument in, in a case about the Electoral College, which points to the fact that we you know, we have an existing electoral system, which may not be the ideal one. You know, it might be much better if we had a, a just one national vote for president with one national set of rules, but that is not our system. We have an electoral college that is very much state-based and is um, a creature of, uh, of complex 
evolution over the two centuries plus now that we've been using it. No single individual designed our system and it shows because <laughs> nobody would take ownership for the system that we currently have. Um, so we're going to have to run this election with our very localized uh, electoral process that we have and, and hope that we run it as well as we can given that. Um, so, and but federalism is going to interact um, with some of the rules that Tim talks about. I mean, again, some states are very good at vote by mail, very comfortable with it. Other states do not have that history. And and again, the reason why I'm the two states that I'm most worried about are Michigan and Pennsylvania, because they are pivotal battleground states in our electoral college system, and they are states that do not have a history of vote by mail. But they've adopted laws even before the pandemic, which allows any voters to, to vote by mail if they want to, which is a good reform in and of itself. But it, but if they get overburdened with demand for vote by mail and lack the institutional capacity for that, we could see real problems emerging in the fall. Um, and I am worried. Amy? Well, so from, a, from the public health perspective, let me add that, yes, we do see very different epidemic patterns across the country. Certainly urban centers on the east and west coast have been hit the hardest. Um, but the, other, but, the, but the, the thing to remember is we have very different public health infrastructures across the, the country. So um, public health systems on the east and west coast have been far more robust as well. So there's a lot we don't know uh, right now about what the actual incidence and prevalence of COVID-19 looks like across the nation. Uh, and it, and it, and it, it certainly could be, it certainly seems to be the case that the numbers in rural communities are lower, but we also know that access to testing and healthcare is not as great in those communities either. As access to healthcare begins to expand, as access to te testing in particular begins to expand, the picture could change, and that could change the dynamics of where people feel risk. So, to, you know, one of the things we, we know from the data, even though the numbers of COVID-19 cases are lower in rural communities, the the rate of increase is actually far higher than it is in urban communities, because these are the communities where social distancing hasn't, the need hasn't been felt, social distancing hasn't been enforced. So we, we need that, we're going to need to see what the picture looks like in November. And we'll begin to see that more that more over the summer. Great, thank you uh, both. Um, our next question is from Jan, uh, and she asks, how do you expect the debates and campaigning to change given COVID-19? Um, so the, you know, the lead up to the election or the, the presumably the, the public debate that yields the judgment of the election? Uh, well, I'll take an initial crack at that. I mean, I think that, it will change and, and the campaigns are going to have to learn to um, evolve. In my mind, though, we, this is going to be a, a unique election because of the, the virus, the pandemic. There's no getting around that. The question is whether it's going to be a successful exercise of democracy, given the, the additional challenges. And as alarmist as maybe my remarks are, I don't want to be fatalistic about it. Um, in that I think as we as both Amy and I were talking earlier, we do have the capacity to do this correctly. Um, but what correctly means has to be recognize the reality of the situation. So if campaigns look a little bit different, if, if there's not door-to-door -door canvassing of get out the vote efforts the way there normally is, that might affect turnout. Not every effect of the virus undermines the legitimacy or validity of the vote itself. Um, and you know, so we're going to, as a as a community of scholars, as a as 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 a democracy, we're going to have to make judgments about what does it mean for the election to work this year. Um, so, to me, if we don't have the normal conventions over the summer, that's that's sad. I mean, it's a pa part of the pageantry of democracy. I always watch the conventions, even if they're roughly scripted and the outcomes, you know, foregone. It's still, again, a civic exercise. It may look a little bit different. Um, the 
in the campaigns, there won't, there may not be rallies in the same way. But that doesn't mean that the votes in November are inauthentic if they're the genuine reflection of the choice that the voters want to make. And if we can do that, we can actually have a free and fair election, um, even though the campaign didn't look look normal. So I would distinguish sharply between the consequences of the um, pandemic, which are unfortunate, unfortunate, but are not existential threats to self-government, versus the consequences that unfortunately might be if we don't take care to avoid them. Amy? No, I think that's I think that's a great analysis. And and the thing I was thinking, Ned, while you were talking is I think it's probably more likely to affect the the arguments that different candidates make, you know, attacking and defending the the pandemic response and and where and how you cast blame and and how and how the how the response is on the part of particularly the US is is presented uh, in comparison to the rest of the world. So I think it's I think science and public health are going to be central to the discussions, um, not the only thing, of course, and it will be fascinating to to watch that play out. And and I think it I think public health and scientists will have an important role in in fact checking in a, in a way that that they haven't in other elections. Absolutely, and we may see disinformation along the public health dimension. Not, you know, we've seen disinformation over other types of the things in the past, but, you know, so excellent point. Great, thank you. Um, okay, our next question is actually a pair of questions that are fairly similar. So we're going to kind of ask them uh, together. Uh, they're from Wendy and Thomas. Um, and they're they're both asking about whether um, there are things we can do as individuals, um, every, in, or everyday people was another way this was expressed, um, to ensure that the elections or are are legitimate, um, and or that the social and political disparities, um, you know, that, that feed into the election are lessened. I think that those kind of concepts uh, uh, go fairly well together. Yeah, well, I'll mention a couple of things real quick. One is, um, if you feel like your own personal health conditions justify it, you know, sign up and volunteer to be a poll worker. Um, there's going to be an incredible need for people to be poll workers who can handle, you know, who don't have the comorbidity conditions or elevated risks. So that's a real way to do that. The other thing is, you know, get your absentee ballot if you want to vote that way as soon as you can. Um, in the election law world, we're talking about flattening the absentee ballot curve. It's not as important as flattening the, the pandemic curve itself to protect the ventilators <laughs> and the ICU units. But what we don't want is for the electoral system to get overwhelmed by a surge of absentee ballot requests at one moment, the way we were worried that hospitals would be overwhelmed with a surge. In, it's the same capacity kind of issue. So if we can spread out absentee ballot requests over a no, large number of weeks, that will make it easier for the election administration system to handle it. So the way to do that is to apply for an absentee ballot, you know, as soon as um, as you can under uh, you know under our legal system. You know, unfortunately here in Ohio, there's still some back and forth between the legislature and the Secretary of State office as to what the rules for getting an absentee ballot are going to be, because right now we have an old fashioned system where you have to request it by mail instead of just going online to request an absentee ballot. So this may be a, a point more applicable right now in other states than Ohio. But as soon as as soon as you can uh, and you want one, you know, don't wait to the last minute to request that absentee ballot. Hmm. Well, that was that's a brilliant political solution to a public health problem, and I love that I love that analogy. And I think the you know the the public health solution there is um, you know this is it's going to seem like uh, you know sort of the thing you've been hearing. The, the more we can do to keep everybody safe, the the more likely it's going to be for those who don't. Um, flatten the absentee ballot curve to be able to feel confident voting in the fall. And the, the cornerstones of prevention remain the same. Wash your hands, 
wash your hands often with soap and water and um, wear a mask, not to protect yourself, but to protect other people. Um, so I, th I think one of the great you know, signs of, of promoting civic life right now is to protect a mask. Because that's, that's, that's saying I care enough about your health that I'm, that I'm willing to I endure this discomfort for a little while. And it doesn't mean you know, outside when you're jogging necessarily in a park where you're, you can stay away from people, but, uh, and then maintain social distancing, uh, that, maintain that physical distancing, that six feet when you're out in public places. Uh, and because we know, we know distance works, we know limiting time and rooms uh, works, and we know that washing your hands works, of course, keeping your hands off here your face um, and uh, everything that we can do to to uh, let's don't say flatten because we're not it's you know we beyond the flattening the curve but let's call it taming the curve keeping it keeping it at a manageable level going forward uh, you know not letting it it's not going to ever zip you know it's not going to go down to zero and stay there but you know check you know checking it so that we keep it from bumping up and that really it really just depends on our our, our, our collective behavior Great, thank you. Um, so uh, we have another nicely paired um, a couple of questions here that I'm going to ask together um, from Joey and Thomas. Um, uh, they ask whether you distrust the government's public health message or the president's proclamations. To what degree does the delegitimization delegitima of the state make any election or transfer of power or lack of transfer of power um, possible? And sort of in a more particular case, does the president's anti-vote by mail rhetoric um, uh, worry you? Uh, and more specifically, if he loses the election in November by a narrow margin, do you envision a serious effort to delegitimize the election? Well, uh, yes, unfortunately, I think we have to be prepared for this risk. And um, again, even before the pandemic hit us, we in the election law program at Ohio State have been working very hard to think about the concept of a legitimate transfer of power. And, and uh, we had an event uh, uh, last week where we were worried about that the outcome of the presidential election would be disputed and that the dispute could really rage on even longer than Bush versus Gore did and go all the way to Congress. And I won't rehash all of that, but I'm happy to explore some aspects of that if that's useful. I, I think that the one key point here is that under the Constitution, the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, Congress declares the official winner of the election based on the electoral votes it receives from the states. And that, that meeting will be January 6th of 2021. And if both houses of Congress say, we know who the winner is, that result will prevail regardless of what the incumbent office holder says, because the Constitution is absolutely clear that that's the Congress's prerogative. So if we have bipartisan and bicameralism in Congress declaring a winner, I, th I think the, the public will perceive that the system worked. The risk is when the two houses of Congress disagree because the 12th Amendment doesn't tell us exactly what to do with that kind of gridlock. And you could foresee that if, if the two parties disagree and one party controls the Senate and the other party controls the US House of Representatives. We had that problem without a pandemic back in the 1876 election of Hayes versus Tilden that none of us were around for. But, but if you reread that history, it's pretty frightening because Inauguration Day was March 4th back then, and there wasn't a resolution until March 2nd. And the incumbent, Ulysses Grant, who was not on the ballot, was so worried that there were gonna be two simultaneous inauguration ceremonies that he had contingency plans for martial law because he knew there couldn't be two commanders and chiefs at the same time. So he was like, yikes, we're 48 hours away from a true constitutional crisis. I think that would be a lot harder for us to handle now, you know, with nuclear weapons. The military needs to know who to give the nuclear football to at noon on January 20th. So the idea that the presidential election might be unresolved 
on January 18th is, is truly scary and hope we don't get anywhere close to that. But the flip side of that scary scenario is that if you know the leadership of Congress announces very quickly, meaning mid-November, it doesn't have to be election night, but, it, but if, if by middle of November, we have closure in Congress as to who, who's won, then I think we have a peaceful transition of power. Amy, did you want to jump in on that at all? No, the only question, it's really a question for Ned. So do you, do you think that that's uh, a contested election is, is just as likely if there's a landslide uh, versus uh, at least, you know, the, 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 the argument that it wasn't, that the outcome wasn't legitimate either, either way, uh, even, even in the face of a landslide, couldn't we, and it, it might not have the same, uh, you know, repercussions in terms of the transition of power, but um, I, I, I wonder if we're going to have be having that discussion one way or the other. Well, yeah, no, and I'm, and this does, I think, tie into the public health point. I mean, we've been seeing these demonstrations here in Ohio and Michigan and elsewhere, where, you know, a, a rel, as I understand it, a relatively small percentage of the total population is very vociferous in its protests. And some of those protests have been with, you know, uh, semi-automatic weapons in an effort to kind of intimidate the political system. So I, I think realism requires us to acknowledge, you know, that um, even in a landslide situation, if the losing candidate doesn't concede defeat and takes to Twitter and social media to try to uh, gin up this, you know, discord, there will be pockets of social discord, you know, that I, that I worry about could be ugly. Um, but then, and, and I'm going to maybe kick this to Michael, the, the political scientist. You know, it, whether or not, again, if that's still under 10% of the population, under 5% of the population, and the rest of the country, you know, rallies around a bipartisan conclusion that we've got an answer, whether or not. You know that degree of unrest from a small pocket of armed, unhappy people is a is a worrisome social pathology that we should really be concerned about, or is it confined enough that it's not going to take over our whole political system? Well, very briefly, I I would be very concerned. I mean, if you just think about the kind of backlash we experienced with tiny groups like in Waco, Texas, or the Mich parts of the Michigan militia or up in the Pacific Northwest, um, the, uh, the sort of political tumult that was um, caused by uh, the, the perceived need to crack down on a relatively small number of well-armed dissidents um, was you know, pretty disruptive. Um, and I think um, that this time around it could be considerably larger than that. Um, and so while, e while in absolute terms, a relatively small number of people, it could have outsized effects on um, sort of political stability and um, uh, actually, let me take back political stability, but that it would be a serious trauma um, that the country would have to deal with. That's, but, um, that's speculative, but I, I do worry uh, about that. Okay, I think we've got time for one more uh, question. And this question is from Rick, who points out that Dean Fairchild has experienced public health decision-making in New York, Texas, and now Ohio. Um, how would you describe the relations between politics and science in those locations? Do the places have different levels of risk tolerance, um, different sort of interactions uh, with uh, public health and politics? Uh, that's uh, that's a that's a great question. So, um, you know, I I was in New York um, over the, the you know the period of several um, mayor, mayoral administrations. I worked at the New York City Department of Health. I'm um, sorry, the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute in the in the early 1990s. Um, uh, so I I had you know Mayor Koch, Mayor Dinkins, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, and and. Uh, you know, New York is a place where it's it's got a long history of a very strong uh, Department of Health. I think a very typically a very good relationship between the Department of Public Health and and the Mayor's office and the Governor and the the State Health Commissioner. 
and it's it's a it's a place in which um, you know there are you know there are more I think resources and, and social services and um, um, money for public health infrastructure. It's a place too in which uh, in which th this this the health department with not always with support, sometimes with backlash, because you could, you could take the battles over trying to cap the size of sodas as an example, but it, it had been pretty successful in, in aggressive public health measures, like some of the highest, I think actually the highest tobacco taxes anywhere in the, in the nation. Um, and so I, I think there's been a, a good alignment typically between uh, legislatures, city, the, the mayor of New York City, and and the, the governor's office um you know texas i was really you know have recently only been there for for, for three years and, and of course i've been following the um the the, the covid 19 response there and um i it's, it's a very different public health system it's very very decentralized there isn't a strong there isn't a strong um state health department there's not really a strong city or municipal health department that compares to um, uh, the New York City Department of Public Health and Mental Hygiene. And so you have a couple of county health departments, Harris County, Williamson County, that tend to be strong, but it's such a fragmented system. And, and I think one of the consequences is that you see, um, you know, some of the worst health outcomes in, in the nation. Um, when you look at Ohio, you see also some very poor health outcomes. But I think the thing that is remarkable about Ohio uh, in, the, in the, the not even year that I've been here, I think is a really good alignment of, of public health science and political decision making. Um, so I think Ohio stands out in terms of, of, uh, of having a, a Republican governor who has, you know, depending on, on what public health issues you care most about, whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's women's right to an abortion, um, you know, would see him differently in terms of, of the kind of, um, uh, you know, progressive or conservative public health figure that, that, that he is. But uh, I think the thing that I've really, been really impressed with is Ohio, in Ohio is the alignment between um, science and political decision making in the governor's office. Great, thank you so much, um, both of you. So we're uh, just about out of time now. So I wanna take a moment uh, on behalf of the audience uh, and myself and the, the organizers um, to thank you both so much uh, for taking the time out of your schedules to participate and for fantastic participation. And I really wanna emphasize uh, that this, uh, in my mind anyway, goes beyond uh, standard thanks uh, for uh, participants in things like this, in that uh, both uh, Amy and Ned are extraordinarily busy right now doing, uh, and that's uh, doing the work that is precisely makes them uh, valuable ex experts for this sort of an exercise. Um, uh, Ned was part of an ad hoc committee uh, for uh, fairness and legitimacy in the 2020 election uh, and uh, has done just a great public service uh, in uh, contributing to that and, and coming forth with recommendations uh, to shore up, uh, getting, getting out ahead of the potential problems that we have coming. Uh, and as many of you know, Ohio State and uh, the School of Public Health in particular are also contributing greatly to the state of Ohio and beyond right now uh, in helping us through the crisis. And Amy, as the leader of the School of Public Health, has just been doing uh, outstanding uh, and uh, remarkably uh, thorough work uh, in facilitating that. So um, uh, on behalf of all of the people in the audience, I wanna thank you once more for your participation. And I'll close by thanking the audience. Uh, we wouldn't have had uh, an event without you. I hope you enjoyed uh, this discussion and um, be well, stay well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.